My name is Janae Nelson and I am President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, or LDF. I join my colleagues in commending the work of this committee and celebrating the unanimity of support on the need for reform of the ECA on this panel. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify on the perils facing our democracy and on the urgent need to enact responsive and expansive federal legislation that prevents the sabotage of our elections. Sabotage that can happen through discriminatory barriers to the ballot and the manipulation of election results in ways that disproportionately target communities of color. Historians will study the period between 2020 and 2025 for decades to come as they seek to explain the next century of American life. They will ask the question, did we act when we had the chance or did we squander our last best hope to protect the freedom to vote and save our democracy? The answer to that question lies in part in the actions of this committee. And so I come before you today to sound a piercing alarm. Longstanding voting discrimination is intensifying at the same time that efforts at election sabotage through manipulation have again come to the fore, accompanied by the normalization of political violence. Voters of color face the greatest assault on our voting rights since Jim Crow. U.S. democracy is in crisis because of a deep-seated, irrational, and discriminatory fear of the truly inclusive, multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy that our nation has never been, but our increasingly diverse electorate holds the promise to deliver. Those who reject and fear that vision of democracy have proven that they are willing to sabotage our elections to avoid its fruition and to destroy our democracy in the process. To prevent another January 6th and to bring our democracy back from the brink, Congress must act swiftly and expansively to address the full range of these challenges, including rampant voting discrimination that has for centuries impeded the equal voice and power of voters of color. We also need urgent action to resolve ambiguities and curb opportunities for abuse in the electoral process, as the other panelists have explained. In other words, strengthening the Electoral Count Act must be the start of this committee's and this Congress's work, but not the end. We are encouraged by and commend the bipartisan working group's thoughtful progress on the ECRA for all the reasons I've noted. Shoring up the ECA is both a democracy issue and a racial justice issue. We also believe the ECA can be strengthened further, and I offer the following principles as a guide. First, any reform should eliminate both ambiguities in the law and opportunities for manipulation while preserving voters' ability to enforce their rights under existing law. Next, any judicial process to determine the official slate of presidential electors for Congress to count should be conducted according to established and clear guidelines and be fair and unbiased, both in fact and in appearance. That process must yield a single definitive and final result that is not subject to competing outcomes prior to the meeting of the Electoral College. In addition, this process must not intrude on voters' prerogative to seek relief against discrimination, undue burdens, or due process violations in state or federal court. Finally, we recommend clarifying the ECRA's language so there is no ambiguity that Congress is conclusively bound by an ascertainment as affirmed or revised by a state court, a federal court for statutory or constitutional reasons, or the particular federal judicial review process described in the ECRA. My written testimony contains more detailed suggestions for this committee's consideration, including ways to improve the bipartisan working group's companion legislation so that it fulfills its potential as a complement to the ECRA. At bottom, however, is this most important point. Protections against voting discrimination and voter suppression and protections against election manipulation and subversion are distinct yet mutually reinforcing ways to prevent election sabotage. And both are necessary to ensure that the votes and voices in our increasingly diverse electorate are equally heard, counted, and honored. Congress must act now 
to root out voting discrimination and prevent election subversion. That all important work begins with this committee and I look forward to your questions. Ms. Nelson, um, you testified that reforming the Electoral Count Act is only one step in protecting our democracy. I know you'd like to see some changes. We can go over those later. But could you speak to why additional legislation like the Freedom to Vote Act uh, and John Lewis bill would complement uh, the work that we've done here? Ms. Nelson. Yes, because election sabotage happens not just after ballots are cast and votes are manipulated, it can happen in the way that the electorate is shaped through voter suppression laws and through laws that erect barriers to the ballot. And so the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, restoring and strengthening core protections against voting discrimination that we lost in the Voting Rights Act of 1965 when the Supreme Court struck down the uh, provision and disabled it. We also need the Freedom to Vote Act to set minimum standards for access to the polls so that voters in Florida and Georgia and Texas can benefit from same-day voter registration, for example, or robust vote by mail and ballot return procedures, just like voters in California and Colorado and other states. The uniformity of those voting measures will restore and bring uh, greater confidence to our electoral system and, uh, and will complement the work of the ECRA. Can you please expand on your testimony regarding the barriers to access that voters across the country will continue to face regardless of whether or not we reform the Electoral Count Act? Yes, thank you, Senator Padilla, for that question. Um, as I said, both orally and in the written testimony, election sabotage does not occur only once a ballot is cast. It is also determined by who gets to cast a ballot in the first place and under what conditions. We know that voter discrimination and voter suppression is still rampant in our electoral system. We know that there have been uh, hundreds of bills proposed and passed in states across the country that limit access to the ballot and that particularly have a disproportionate impact or were directly targeted at black and brown and other marginalized voters. What the Electoral Reform Act will do is to resolve many of the ambiguities concerning how votes are counted and what certifies an election and ascertainment and to shore up so many ways that the exploitation of election results might occur. But it doesn't deal with the process of inputs of who gets to vote and under what conditions. And that is why it must be complemented by legislation that protects the right to vote and restores the Voting Rights Act to its full capacity and creates uniform standards across the country for voters that cannot be manipulated or in any way uh, discriminated against based on race or another protected characteristic. We know what's in the bill. Is there anything else that you would suggest to this committee that be added to the bill to make it even better? We think that with respect to the timing, uh, while we are not promoting a particular time period for expansion, that the six days for litigation is, uh, they're rather tight if we consider what needs to happen within that time period. So we urge the committee to think about some expansion of time for litigation and to ensure that there aren't any unintended consequences. We've also raised some issues concerning the assignment of judges for the judicial process to ensure that there is no actual and, and more importantly, no appearance of bias that may undermine public confidence in the process. Uh, we also believe that the right to a mandatory appeal to the Supreme Court is something that this panel should consider and think about uh, ensuring the Supreme Court's review of these all important issues when they arise through the federal judicial process outlined in the ECRA. And then also to make it very clear that the process in the ECRA does not supplant or supersede any state or federal court avenues. And I think that we've articulated that several times in this discussion today, but we want to reiterate that point because it's very important that voters still have an opportunity to vindicate their rights under state and federal law outside of that process. 